I'm Luca Giliberti, contributing writer for Gold Derby, and I'm joined today by Polly Morgan, the cinematographer of The Woman King. So Polly, um, I read that going in, you wanted to make this movie resemble a David Attenborough documentary, which I found to be such a fascinating approach. So in which ways did you want that to be the case? And would you say that that approach persisted throughout filming? Yeah, I mean, I think when I was thinking about the color of the movie and and sort of the look that I was going for, you know, I sort of grew up watching the amazing BBC documentaries that David Attenborough um, has done in his career. And I just always felt the color palette was so evocative and um, it really excited me to sort of be thrown into the worlds in which he was investigating. So I kind of wanted the audience of this movie to feel the same way. You know, I wanted mm -hmm. to do justice to the environment. I wanted it to be rich and beautiful. Um, and I wanted to honor the legacy of these characters. So, um, you know, it was my starting off inspiration. Um, and yeah, hopefully I carried it all the way through. Um, I think, you know, stylistically, sometimes, you know, you veer away from what might be completely real, but um, yeah, I hope that I sort of carried that theme throughout throughout the movie. Absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned the legacy of the characters, and I think we get such a great introduction to them in the opening scene, um, which chronicles the enemy, uh, the battle at enemy village, in which there's such a beautiful marriage between, you know, the moonlight with the palm oil uh, of the, on the Agogia skin. So talk a bit about, you know, um, how you storyboarded this opening and how you wanted to introduce these characters to the audience, or at least some of the movie's main characters. Yeah, I mean, that was, you know, uh, the first thing that we actually shot in production was that mm -hmm. sequence. Um, yeah, and we were up in a location in the north of South Africa. So um, it was a, a sort of starting off the movie with a bang because it was a lot for everybody um, to pull off. But um, we did really storyboard it. We did some stunt viz with Danny Hernandez, the stunt coordinator. Um, and we did a lot of rehearsals, just sort of really choreographing the actors move with the camera movement. Um, what doesn't really translate so much in the movie was the fact that we did do these very long runners in which we would follow the action. Um, and we did these very long takes, which, um, you know, we really wanted to do in order to really show off the physicality of these women and show that they were all doing the stunts themselves and to really just try and, you know, drag the viewer into this experience, you know, with sort of with a bang. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think when I read the script and I sort of read with Viola Davis kind of rising out of the grasses, it was such an arresting image in my mind that um, I really wanted the viewer to feel the same way. And, you know, I didn't want it to feel over lit. I wanted to find a very delicate balance between, you know, seeing these dark skinned actors in the middle of Africa at night in the 19th century. Um, and so, you know, we really tried hard to, you know, make sure that the lighting wasn't overwhelming um, and we could supplement the ambient moonlight with, you know, the real interactive warmth of the firelight. Um, what you don't see or don't realize behind the scenes is um, as we were moving the camera around with the action, we were sort of using a dimmer system to bring lights up and down, sort of choreographed with the movement so that, you know, as we swung around, you know, the sort of the backlight would fade down and another backlight would fade up so that the actors weren't ever front lit or anything felt too um, forced, basically. Yeah, and you know, I, it's such an electrifying opening scene. And I really love that shot of Naniska um, resting the machete on her uh, shoulder before she charges at the encampment um, of men. You know, was that scripted or who came up with that? Because I found it to be such striking imagery. Yeah, I mean, all that opening was very carefully written by Dana. Um, and, you know, like you said, it was evocative on the page as it was on the screen. Um, and I think, you know, we really wanted to just highlight the power and physicality of these women, you know, show all their strength. And I think, you know, the truth that they did cover their bodies in this palm oil so that they couldn't be grabbed by their enemy mm -hmm. really helped me lighting wise, because it really helped to, um, you know, give highlights to their skin and, and define them from the background. 
Absolutely. And let's actually talk about the final frame of the actual battle. Um, when you see Naniska hovering over one of the men, either before or after she slits his throat, and then you have like the fire in the background <laughs> on the right side. And I know that this was a shot you and Gina Prince Bythewood, the director, uh, were very proud of. So, you know, talk about the composition of that exact shot and the meaning of the fire uh, in the background, considering it kind of, you know, bookends um, this movie. Well, you know, we um, work with Akeen McKenzie, the production designer, to um, orientate the enemy village. Um, and we knew where the prisoner hut was in relation to the central fire in the middle of the village. And, um, you know, I worked with him to place different fires around the environment so that I could always have that contrasting warm firelight to the ambient moonlight. So I had that color contrast. And, um, you know, we knew that Naniska would um, basically have her final moment with the um, the sort of the village leader outside the prisoner um, hut. And we wanted to frame her within the fire. You know, we wanted to use that motif of, um, you know, the power and energy of the fire and just to use that to really just frame her as a character and show her her strength. Yeah, it's such a beautiful shot. And, you know, when it comes to Naniska, actually, uh, what we have on the one hand is, you know, this fierce, revered leader of the Agogia, this battle-torn, seemingly tough as steel warrior. But on the other hand, you have this very vulnerable, very traumatized woman who has in some ways cut herself off, you know, from her younger self and from some of the emotion that emotions that have been brewing inside her for such a long time. So how much of a difference was there uh, throughout the movie um, in the way that you shot her in scenes where she appeared more as the leader versus some of the more intimate or more private or more vulnerable scenes? Yeah, I mean, I think that Viola Davis was such an incredible performer to work with. Um, she really just gave it 110% always. Um, I mean, I think the difference of shooting her in battle and wanting to capture her in all of her, um, you know, physicality and just show off what she trained so hard to do, um, you know, was to just, you know, maybe frame her slightly wider um, and then obviously move in for the emotion um, because there was, like you said, you know, she's coming to terms and um, upfront with her sort of her nemesis, you know, the guy that abused her and raped her in her youth. Um, and so, you know, not only do we want to show off her um, her action, but also the emotion in her face as she's fighting him. Um, but, you know, what I love so much about this movie is, yes, it's got a lot of action, but also at its heart, it really is a drama. And I think for me, that's what really excited me about working on the film was this emotional core and this woman's journey and not only her journey, but also now his journey alongside her. Yeah. And I think, you know, another favorite scene of mine is the scene in the baths when Naniska yeah. reveals to Naui that she's her daughter and the fact that, um, you know, we bring Naui in with all this motion and this sort of fluid camera, but ultimately, it's all about the close-ups, you know, mm -hmm. these still close-ups that are kind of breathing with the characters and um, just to really let the drama of their performances sing um, and have a quiet camera and try and sort of enhance their performance with, you know, the tone of the light um, and make sure that everything is kind of working together in order to enhance the drama of the scene and help the viewer kind of evoke the same emotion that the characters are feeling. Right, when I talked to um, Tara Lynn A. Shropshire, the, uh, the editor, she really said that she, everyone wanted there to be a sense of revelation in that scene. Even though the movie has in a way, you know, been building to that point, um, there's still a sense of revelation because we're supposed to be in Nawi's position, we're supposed to be in Naniska's position. And it's, I, it's my favorite scene in the movie, especially because you just get to see how the actors process the information, how Tusu and Bedu as Nawi gets to process that information before reacting to it. And I just love how the actors' performances are allowed to breathe because, as you said, you know, the camera is just on their faces. It's not, you know, there's not a bunch of flashy camera work there. So yes. I assume that was the intention uh, mostly, yes. right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think it's that balance, isn't it, of like, you know, sort of the push and pull of the energy and the dynamic camera and then just those moments to quieten down and really just be still and, and kind of let the drama speak for itself. Absolutely. And, you know, what we see um, happen after that scene, 
um, is that these two characters, so Nawi and Naniska, you know, they go on their individual journeys, which then kind of converge again uh, in the final battle at Frida, where um, I think the description intimately epic, which has been so often used to describe this movie, um, really applies because it's really the emotional payoff that drives the action. So what was important to you when shooting that final confrontation between Naniska and Oba? And how does it differ from that earlier face-off we see between the two characters earlier on in the movie? Well, I mean, I think in that final battle, it is a lot more intimate. You know, we spent this movie getting to know these two characters. We've journeyed with them. We've seen their interactions. And at this point, you know, once he's taken off the horse, it's really all about, you know, the emotion in their faces and, you know, the real anger and the real just sort of like energy that drives them. Um, and I think for, you know, Viola Davis, she just brought so much to that scene. I mean, she's 57. Yeah. And the fact that she was able to do her own stunts and fight um, Jimmy and do all of that work was was so um, inspiring to watch. And I think it was just being close with them um, and really just taking the viewer into that final battle and just being wide angled lens, you know, close up and just almost feeling the breath and feeling that power of, you know, almost the messiness right at the end yeah. of how they kind of scrap to to the death almost. Um, and how Naniska, honestly, she's not this strong warrior that ends, you know, perfect. She gets injured, she's tired. Um, and then this reveal of her daughter sort of coming in at the end and lifting her up and then uh, defending her. Yeah, it's such a beautiful scene. I love what you mentioned about, you know, it's not an easy fight. I mean, she doesn't just win right away and she really does have to fight, which I think is a great theme throughout this movie. The Agoji are not invincible. And I think that's also something we talked about the opening scene earlier. That's something that's established right there. And I think you really see that carry out through throughout the movie. Um, I know we jumped to the ending here, but I actually want to go back briefly um, to toward the beginning of the movie, um, because after that epic opening of the um, battle at enemy village, you know, things slow down a bit and, and the audience is introduced to the kingdom of Dahomey, to the Dahomey palace um, and to the courtyard of the Agogia. Um, and I would like to focus on the courtyard and um, the general living space of the Agogia, which has almost an ethereal quality um, and really has distinctive looks uh, during the day and at night. So what was important to you, Gina, and everyone else when it came to the aesthetic of this important location? Yeah, I mean, I think you kind of touched on it before. It's, you know, these were real characters, you know, like mm -hmm. they weren't invincible. They're not superheroes. And I think that, um, you know, that authentic nature to this movie, we really wanted to bring through in all of the imagery. Um, and I think... So much of this movie was based on research that was done, like so much reading, so much investigating on sort of how this palace was, you know, what light sources they would use, how they lived, how they cooked, how they prayed, how they slept, you know, all of that. So um, we really took all of that as our inspiration. And I think in the daytime, um, you know, I really wanted to make sure that it felt very visceral, you know, that it mm -hmm. felt um, textural and it wasn't too clean or too glossy. And um, actually in prep, when after we had scouted South Africa, we came back to Los Angeles and I worked carefully with the art director and the gaffer to make sure that they built the palace in the correct orientation to the path of the sun in South Africa. So that when I was shooting in that square and I was doing all the coverage that I knew that I would be able to use the light to my favor because we did have these massive scenes. I knew that I would have a lot of coverage. I knew that the sun would change, you know, from the morning to the afternoon right. and how I was always going to maintain a certain style of lighting, um, whether that's side light or backlight um, in a way that felt very evocative um, to these characters. Um, and so all of that was taken into consideration. The earth was very lightly laid because of the fact these actors didn't have any shoes on. So we had to rake the earth constantly to make sure they didn't step on stones. Um, and that worked in my favor because it was very windy and all the red earth would kick up and we would have all the dust in the air that would be backlit and give us this, this beautiful feeling of um, sort of texture and, and depth. Um, and then, you know, we used these braziers, these light sources, these fires that were always around, right. um, both in the day and at night. 
And at night, you know, I used, um, you know, they had, they would cook over these open flames, which would feed everybody in the, in the court, in the, in a sort of um, courtyard of these women. And so I motivated atmosphere smoke from that cooking fire and also the little braziers that we would have around that they use for lighting. Um, and, you know, just again, that sort of very soft ambient moonlight um, and then the color contrast of the fire. Um, and then, you know, the atmosphere again to, to provide sort of depth and, and texture to the image. And I think the wonderful thing about it in design was it was, you know, they lived in a very much indoor outdoor space. So we yeah. always had this amazing depth where we could be in the barracks and we could look at the inner courtyard or the outer courtyard and we could connect with spaces. And, um, you know, it was just sort of paying attention to the environment as a whole, like the ensemble cast, but always being able to focus in on the character who was important at the time. Yeah, and like you said, you know, during the day, um, that courtyard, it's, it's almost like kissed by the sunlight. And then at night, it's really that marriage between the torches and the red hue of, of the earth that really stuns. I think it's such a beautiful place and it's so important how it's established early on in the movie. Um, yeah. But to end on a bit of a lighter note, um, I actually want to ask you about the Toronto International Film Festival where the movie premiered. And I just want to ask about what that experience was you know, after working on this movie for many, many months um, to see it with such a big audience, what that experience was like, because I've asked a few uh, crew members and they just said it was one of the, you know, best experiences um, they've ever had gotten to enjoy. So how was it for you? Well, I mean, I think the experience of for all of us to make this movie was a really challenging one. You know, you're sort of out in the in the wilds and dealing with COVID and, um you know, massive sets and, you know, we really didn't know, you know, like if we would be able to continue making the movie because of COVID or what would happen, but we all just believed in this story and in this movie and were so passionate about it. And I think it was such an incredible emotional experience to, you know, have worked so hard and felt so passionately about something and then be in an audience with people and see their reaction and hear their reaction um, and know that they also felt passionately about it and that the hard work that we had done in order to try and convey, you know, the story of these women and show their strength and vulnerability in their journey, that it touched people in the way that it touched us. Um, and I think, you know, it's exciting for me to see the feedback from young women, especially young women of color who are so inspired and who are giving courage um, and who now feel represented by seeing a movie like this on the big screen. Yeah, I can absolutely imagine. I'll just say as someone who had been following mov the movie the entire time to see the reactions out of uh, the Toronto premiere was also just wonderful. And um, <laughs> yeah, um, thank you so much uh, for joining me today to um, talk about your work. Uh, it was really interesting to listen to and congratulations again on the massive success of this movie. Thank you so much. Thank you.